What is going on, all you cool cats and kittens? It is Mike Gascon, the horse guru, coming back with another horse talk live and video review, possibly. We are working on some technical issues with our video, but we are here for Horse Talk Live to catch you up to date on how things have been going around the ranch, how things have been going at our clinics. I just got done, just finished up with a Northeastern private retreat, private clinic uh, roundup. So I have been to four states, four states in the past few days uh, working on ponies. We were in PA, Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania. Uh, so the private retreats are pretty cool. It's when somebody says, hey, you know, I have a horse or I have four horses or I have five horses. I want you to come personally to my ranch and be my guru for a day. And just like a horse genie, my wish is your command. I show up and we work those ponies. So over the course of the past few days up in the Northeast, first off, it was a lovely vacation to get away from the Southern weather. It was feeling lovely up there. But we worked on everything from colt starting. A colt started a 18-year-old Percheron mare uh, under saddle. Uh, I worked on laydowns. We worked on spooky warm bloods in the woods. We worked on smiles. We worked on laydowns. We worked on liberty. Um, just a little bit of everything. And that is the awesome thing whenever you do a private clinic is the day is yours. We get to do whatever you want, whatever topic that you want, whatever you're having an issue with. Uh, I had a, a mean horse that that was a, a little harassive to, to work with. Got to work with him a little bit and share some of my knowledge on dealing with some of the undesirables. It was just an all around good time. Um, I always love to go to different folks places, see their ranches, see their horses. A lot of fun. Very beautiful up there uh, this time of the year as well. We did some trail riding up in Circleville, New York. Really beautiful. Got to do a lot of trail. I took some B-roll and some video. I'll be putting it out soon. Very cool place. Uh, um, difference between private retreat and private clinic. Private clinic is one or two days. Private retreat is if you get a group of people, you travel and you do basically yes. a repeat of so, our retreat. So technical, technical differences between the private clinics and the private retreats. The private clinics. So like I did a basically a northeastern tour. So I would be at one ranch for two days. I would leave, go to another ranch for three, go to another ranch, be there for two. Uh, so on and so forth. And those were private clinics for a day or two. Private retreats is whenever they bring me into a ranch and we basically do the same thing we do at a retreat here, just at somebody's place. Um, same same type of game, same type of ideology, but that's going to be for a week long. So really the time period is the only difference. Uh, and both of those scenarios, whenever it's private and we don't have to cater to everybody, and try to keep it well-rounded. The awesome thing about the private stuff is you get to tailor it however you want to. So whether we work warm bloods and go straight from there, from that kind of English work straight into to Mustang work and natural horsemanship, which is exactly what we did at one of the clinics. Uh, we did a clinic where we had a whole day of groundwork. They wanted nothing but groundwork done. From there, we worked some obstacle work and then from there we the third day we didn't even go into the round paint everything was out in on the trails we spent the whole day in the mountainside uh working ponies so that was pretty cool all right let's see some of these questions and you're live to all the groups at facebook so that way you can take any hey hey facebook people i've got one q a from our insiders and then let hey read that for me just put it. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Facebook user. I have a question about my video review. This is actually, I have her, I believe that this is going to Hey, be. from PA so this and is the Lori. Carolinas. This is Lori. Okay. Um, you did her video review. Um, question for tonight's Horse Talk Live. My question is about my video review on Wednesday, August 9th, when I was working with a German Martingale. 
My ultimate goal in using the German Martingale is to get Gracie to canter slow and easy in the arena. Right now, her, fa- her canter is fast, more of a run, and she's heavy on the forehand. Michael, you said that I should encourage her to lower her head and get soft before cantering. How will I know when she is soft enough to start the canter? Also, would it be beneficial to start her in a round pen at Liberty and ask for the canter and get that canter consistent? Then maybe next get on her and someone asks from the ground for that same consistent canter at Liberty while I'm on her back. Then put the, the German Martingale on her and ask for the canter after she has had the consistent canter. Or should I start at the canter after she is soft enough? This is a multi-part question, but I like where it's headed. The idea of putting a German Martingale or draw reins on a horse to slow down the canter is quite simple. A horse with its head down is going to canter slower than a horse with its head up. It's just how it works. Another thing is the horses can't trot as fast with their head down so they offer the canter earlier but this never the question was do that or do it from the ground first it's never a bad idea to start on the ground the more time you spend on the ground the less time you spend on the ground so it's never a bad idea to get the horse the idea of what you're looking for if you could just point that horse off and canter and then break it back down to a trot and ask it to canter from the middle of the round pin and slow it down that way where it doesn't think that canter means rush It just thinks to lope along. That's great. So there's two ways to go about the same problem. Most people's horses, they canter fast for a couple of reasons. They think canter means fast. They have their head and body all out of position. So they have to rush to stay like they feel balanced. And three, they just haven't cantered enough to not think it's a sprint. Imagine if every time I used the word run, it was very short, you know, Every time you thought run, 40-yard dash, 40-yard dash, uh, 100-meter dash. That's all you thought? It would be very different than when I use the, the word run and we are marathon runners. And, hey, we're going for a run. That means something completely different. So when you're trying to get that horse to lope, those three things. Number one, are they out of position because they're excited about the cannon and their head's all in the air and they have to trot to – to 12, 15 miles per hour before they run into the canter. That's not cool. Um, in that case, I try to slow the, slow the horse down by dropping its head and getting its feet up under him. And if I can keep the horse's head down as it's coming along, uh, the horse will really offer that canter in half of the speed. So instead of 15 miles per hour, they'll offer it at seven, at six. Um, just they don't have the same range of motion. They start offering it earlier. And the earlier they can offer the canter, the more relaxed you can be on their back. But you can absolutely do all the work you want to from the ground to let the horse know what's coming under saddle. Keep scrolling through. I'm going to try to see if I can. If you get a chance to do clinics in the Northeast Ohio, autumn is a great time to come. Average temperature is around 75 for a high, and there are no flies. That sounds lovely. <laughs> I feel like I've they're done. trying to bribe you. I've, yeah, they're, they're bribing <laughs> me with weather. Yeah, no, I was just up in, up in the Northeast, and, and it was probably 80 at the highest. Uh, it, it was pretty cool. I didn't know if you were going to come uh, home. Ohio uh, is a, a fun place. I've been there three times, four times. Uh, Canton, um, outside of Cleveland, and a couple places up that way. It was a good time. So definitely looking forward to headed back that way. Hey, hey, from Kansas. We got Montana on here, Missouri. We have Ohio, the Ozarks. All right. So while we are waiting for videos that are having a technical glitch right now, this is a great opportunity. Usually we save it for the end, but we can do it right now. If you guys have any questions whatsoever to have to do with our four-legged friends feel free to put it on here and i will answer it live in time still waiting for you both to come to australia we love your you and your no nonsense way of training well we are looking forward to come back miss amanda uh we really enjoyed australia and our time there uh it's actually started one of our uh, our new habits that we have. Yeah, we have to get back to the Golden Coast. They had a great weight park over there. Uh, <laughs> it escalated quickly. Well, not quickly. Maryland, Texas, 
Oh, Maryland's on the bucket list. That's one of the few states that I haven't been to to work horses. We're going to have to find a way to get up to, to Maryland. What is the best material for draw reins? Personally, I like marine rope. So if you go to your local, you go to your local boat store, if you go to your local Walmart in the boating section, um, I like a good half inch, half inch rope. Let's say 15 feet will, will fit a wide range of horses. And you just put two clips. I like stainless steel that roll on the reins. And then two clips at the end, and boom, you got yourself a set of draw reins for a fraction of the cost that it would take you to buy them. Nevada, Wisconsin. Uh, I believe we have a private clinic coming up in Wisconsin here uh, in the next month or so. So looking forward to that. That's going to be a good time. Hey, 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 Speckles, one of our graduates. So proud of that young lady out there working them ponies. I'm trying to think of what questions I've had for you on other social media. Everything just basically comes back down. Can you explain the respect series and kind of why that's our go-to? Gotcha. So things? when it comes to, we get a lot of questions about the respect series and the, and just about the series general. of what we do. This is the cool thing about the way that my career has worked out is I have gotten the chance to work thousands of horses. And anytime you do thousands of anything, you just start seeing patterns and the pattern that we found, to tell the truth, it all happened by accident. I decided at one point in time that I wanted to be the very best cult starter in the world. And I've noticed a trend amongst world-class athletes of any type. Two things. You have to be open-minded and willing to learn from anybody, anything, any material you can pick up. And two, you have to be willing to put in more reps than anybody alive. And I was willing to do both of those things, learn from anybody. And I was willing to ride anything and everything to become world class. Well, when I set out on this, it was very hard to get the type of numbers that I wanted for cold starts. So cold start being a horse that had never been ridden before. You know, I could get them, but I couldn't get them by the hundreds. I couldn't get them by the thousands. So it had me scratching my head. Oh, I got this cold starting competition. I really want to practice, uh, but I'm only getting, you know, three or four cold starts. I really want them by the hundreds. So what I started doing is I started going to clinics and in the beginning to fill my clinics, I would say, hey, I'll take anything. And that word anything, people take it very literally. They would send me, I think they would send me Craigslist horses, you know, like the $50 pasture ornament for, for looks only in the neighbor's field, not for riding that type of horse. I think people will buy that and bring it to my clinic just to be entertained. But I started working those horses. And not only that, when I started my clinics, I started everything as if it was a cult start. So if it was a reining horse or a rope horse or a pony or a Percheron or a Paso, it didn't matter. I would start in the beginning and I would, in my mind, I was practicing my cult starting routine for the competition. But this was the epiphany. This was the breakthrough moment. It's through that I started realizing the night and day results that we were getting with each and every horse that was coming through, no matter how old or how young it was, because most horses who have problems, it's a problem in the fundamentals. When a world-class Grand Prix jumping horse starts refusing jumps, it's something fundamental. The horse already is trained. The horse already knows how to jump. The horse is already an athlete. When, when the reining horse gets arena sour and they say, oh, you can't take it in an arena. It'll lose its mind. It already knows how to rein. It already has flying lead changes. It already spins. It already slides. When the rope horse already knows how to rope, but it gets box sour. Uh, all these things, the horse already was trained to do their job and they know it, but something fundamental uh, was missed. And whenever I would restart those horses, I would get ridiculous results. And then I started saying, oh, wait a second. Let me put together this program. And that's what we call the respect series. Respect series starting in, in something as simple as kindergarten, which is simply backing them out of your space. Um, first grade, which is simply lunging them in a circle, but a little bitty circle, just how to walk around you, seeing if they'll bend their head left <coughs> and right. You wouldn't believe how many times I'm riding horses that are 14 or 15 this past weekend. I was hopping on horses that they were riding in the mountains and they didn't know why they were having issues. But in first grade, the horse just drug me all over the place. 
I'm going to tell you guys a secret. If your steering wheel can drag a 200 pound redneck across your field, you're not going to turn it if it gets scared. Okay. So we just figured out one, one step after the next, how to identify the root issue. And the way we do that is we give them the final exam of each grade, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. As soon as they pass a grade, we immediately move to the next grade, give them the final exam. Do they pass it? Great. Move to the next grade. So if people had advanced horses that were very well schooled, we were on their back and working in five minutes. But I'm telling you, 90% of all the horses I've ever worked, they have failed somewhere early on in the program kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, the moment they fail something, it's like a check engine light. Like, hey, here's your issue. Ding, 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 ding. You found it. So that way we are able to identify the issue, get to the root of it, work on that. And then once we get them over that, boom, all their training shows back up. The hunky dory horse that, that was doing good before that shows up. And that has really been our bread and butter is our ability to walk into any place. When I go to these clinics, I'll show up to these clinics with a grocery bag sized duffel bag of equipment, a halter, a lead rope, a set of reins, maybe a snaffle. Let's work. What do you got? Doesn't matter. This past weekend, I worked everything from a literal POA, a pony, to a Percheron 18 year old uh, mare that we started in a row for the first time. And I did it all with that limited amount of tools. And we were able to do that because of the system, because of the respect series and just putting one foot in front of the other, one step in front of the other. Uh, and it didn't matter. Some places we had arenas, some places we had round pins. I did a clinic uh, in a field, uh, in the field on the side of a hill. Just doesn't matter. My, when I used to get too complicated, my mother used to tell me, son, you could work a horse in a patch of grass. And at that time, especially when I was younger, I was like, I like all the, the gadgets and the, and the different tack. And I, th I thought I had to have those things to work a horse. Uh, but she was absolutely right. Uh, the older I get, the more I realize that you don't need a lot to work a horse. You just have to have the, the right mindset and you have to have a plan. Uh, what are you going to do? You don't want to be a wandering generality. You want to be a meaningful, specific so many people, they just want to go and get on their horse. That's the equivalent of me going out into the to the carport and hopping in my truck. Now what? You have to have a plan, a direction, an idea of where you're trying to go and what you're trying to, to do. And if you can do that, you can really make it far. And I really see, I'm really proud uh, of this program and how far it's come. And not only that, how repeatable. Um, in the beginning, it, it just kind of looked like a freak show because I was the only one that believed in it. So I was the only one doing it. So it looked like I was just bit by a radioactive horse or something weird was going on. Maybe I, my, my father dropped me in some nuclear waste whenever he was fishing in the, in the base of Guantanamo or something like that. Uh, but as it turns out, we have all of these academy students in our academy now going for this competition to become the next, uh, the next trainer here at the ranch. And Five horses get started, five different people are able to start the horse in, in the same allotted amount of time. Uh, five people start a horse that's never been ridden, a cold horse, a quarter horse, and they're out of the round pen in one day. Five people start a paso, hot horses, crazy, paso fricos. They're out of the round pen in one day. Within two or three days, they're doing obstacles. They're doing trail rides. The horse is easy to deal with. The horse knows left and right and is able to, to, to give um, no issues, no bucking, no problems um, to, to see that on repeat with other people doing it and other young folks, you know, that are coming up with, with maybe not as much horse experience, but looking forward to be horse trainers. Each and every of those horses that they're a month or two under saddle now, all of them are driving a carriage around by themselves. Um, all of them have a tap lay down that they have smiles. They're doing Liberty. Oh, yeah, we had a Liberty uh, competition. Uh, all of them are able to do liberty circles, which is off-leash obedience uh, and big open spaces. So it's really cool to see how you can layer that behavior and pattern pattern behaviors and just get put one thing right on top of another, like building blocks. Very cool to see. Now I'm going to have my narrator read out some of these questions. I have to get in front of the screen because no, I have no, the... There you go. I do. I can't see it from over here. It's got a screen protector on it. All right. 
Let's see. Ooh, all kinds of fun stuff. Okay. Oh, yeah. We got questions for days. Okay. Perfect. Hey, from Idaho. Okay. South Carolina, Jersey, Wisconsin, Long Island. There we go. Idaho, Missouri. I'm just yelling out names. Yes. Go, go ahead. Do you ever feel that a horse is smarter than you? All the time. I, I, <laughs> I haven't felt that yet. I truly believe, I truly believe that our only advantage above a horse is that we're smarter than them. I really believe if your horse was smart, we would not be able to ride them. I repeat, if your horse was, was smart, you know, we'd like to give everybody all the ponies credit. If they were smart, you wouldn't ride them. They're stronger than us. They're faster than us. They're in better shape than us. They're more capable than us. They're more explosive than us. They're more territorial than us. Like everything about them is better than what, what we do. Uh, if they were smarter than you, uh, you wouldn't be able to ride them. So anytime that I feel myself kind of getting frustrated, and, and granted, I'm telling you something that's very simple, but it was not easy for me at all. Uh, when I first started my career as a, a young macho man trainer, I had to listen to Garth Brooks and George Strait in my headphones at all times, slow old 90s country to slow my brain down because early on I took everything personal. So it was like the horse was outsmarting me. Every time they kicked or bucked or bit or did anything, I took it personal. Like the horse is trying to kill me. Uh, and then those, all those horses seem smarter than me. But now I'm riding all their grandchildren and their grandchildren are very easy to ride and they have no chance. But the difference is I don't take anything uh, personal. I mean, if they kick or buck or bite, I'm going to put you out of position where you can't pressure me and I can pressure you. You get the right answer. I'll stop pressuring you. That's the thing you want to do. So many times when you feel like the horse is smarter than you, it's because they're making you uncomfortable until they can get the release that they want. And now they're training you instead of you training them. Next. All right. Um, let's see. I've been working on moving the shoulders with Star, our blind horse. We are struggling. I've started on the ground. And when I have her bent around me and trying to move the shoulder, she freezes up. I'm not sure what to do more. Hoping to get a video for next week. Gotcha. So, imagine may, that's Barb. So, what you may have to do with Star, if she's a blind horse and you're trying to push her shoulders over and get her to yield. Number one, remember forward, forward, forward. So, you might have to bend her less than you bend the rest of the horses. And then you physically might have to nudge or bend or put a spur on, on her to put so she knows to step away from it. So, she knows that she's being uncomfortable. So many times. Ground, so. so many times. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's on the yeah. ground. So many times on the ground with our normal horses we're just able to hey hey put a hand up and they they step over and then that's our shoulder yield and we don't even physically touch them with a horse that can't see them you may have to physically touch her leg or, like, or get like the end of your of your crop or something that yeah just, just something just something, show her. just something you could push on her to let her know to step away but just remember don't over bend her uh, just a very slight bend and then bump her in the circle i mean you, you can have the end of this uh pin and anything bumper with your thumb you, you can bumper just like this bing bing uh just something let her know to step over all right next next question is saludos let's see oh now it's all in the front okay Lori says when i'm doing mini reps how can i tell that my horse is irritated and i'm working the try out of it and nikolai will give up and walk but now that i get a bit of the canner he has no steering what to do Gotcha, gotcha. Do you want it off? Yeah. You don't like looking at it? Hide. There you go. All right. When it comes to knowing when to stop what you're doing, for me, I like to keep it. You know, I'm kind of country, so I just use these simple words. Do it until they don't suck at doing it. When they look like, uh-huh, I got it, especially the harder it was for them to get, I stopped doing it. Horses around me, they get a rude awakening on day one, day two, day three, because I'm actually making them work and try and focus. Uh, so sometimes that looks uh, abrupt or I'm asking them in the back and they're throwing their head around or doing whatever. But very quickly, they like their time here and they like their job because I leave them alone. If you just do what I ask you to do, I won't keep asking it. So many people find failure because they do something successful. So many people find failure through success. They work hard. They get the horse to do the exercise. So instead of letting the horse know that they did the exercise right by stop asking them and say, hey, if you do that, it's over. If you do that, it's over. 
for the lay down, for example, when I lay a horse down, I lay a horse down one time a day. And then I don't do it again. One time tomorrow, one time the day after, one time the day after that, one time the day after that. Well, the horse thinks, man, if I just lay down, it's over. I know a lot of folks who, when they teach a horse to lay down, they'll lay a horse down a half a dozen times. Well, man, what's the point of them laying down? If they get up, they're going to have to lay down again. So when a horse is flexing, well, when they fight, they get pulled on. And then when they get soft, they get pulled on. Well, might as well argue. So do it until they don't suck at doing it and then stop doing it. The reward for everything is to stop doing that. When it comes to cantering and losing your steering wheel, do power of the circle. Power of the circle is put anything in the middle of your circle, whether it's a tree, uh, a tree, a cone, a dead cat, anything, uh, just something, just something to envision. Put your eyes on it. If they are cantering around that circle and they're blowing outward like they're running away with you, keep your eyes on the cat, disengage them and, and stay in the circle. If they get too close because they're crashing and leaning inward, pick up your inside rein and push them outward very quickly. There's three doors. If you crash in, you get pulled into your shoulder and pushed out. That's uncomfortable. If you try to run away, you get disengaged and face back up. That's uncomfortable. If you stay between my hands and legs, no matter how fast we're going, that is where the release is. Hey, I have one. He is a month old. How do I get him to lead? He was doing well for a while. Also, what do you recommend to do working with him? He's a month old. To get him to lead, go ahead and put your halter on. And a lot of times for the babies that, of that age, I don't like to put all the bind on their face, pulling, especially in a straight line. Uh, so what I would do is I put a rope around their butt as well. And I touch their face and then I goose them. I touch their face and then I goose their butt. And very quickly, they want to lead with me. And let's say you are leading him around and you just have a halter on. Anytime that he gets stuck, I want you to move off to the left or the right and break those front feet loose, which will make his feet move. The quicker and earlier you can get him turning left and turning right, the easier he'll lead. So it's not uncommon for me at all to, if they don't want to move, I'll walk around their butt with the rope and, and flex them and have them follow their face. I'll follow me until I break them loose in a circle and I'll just walk circles around them until I get all four feet moving. If you can get two feet moving, you can get four. Uh, so keep that in mind, left and right, don't argue in a straight line. If you are going to go in a straight line, do not be afraid to goose him with the butt rope. Yeah, don't just sit there and pull and pull and pull yeah. and stretch their neck out. Don't, the rest of them yeah, don't, don't argue in a, in a straight line. Horses are strong. They're even, even babish. Can you talk a bit about how long to use the German martingale? You mentioned it in the video that if we don't use it correctly or for too long, the horse can get resistance and then you have to go back and soften again. How do I know how long to use it? What things to look for and what to avoid in resistance? This is the biggest thing, simplest thing. And this is a German martingale. This is a draw rein. Anything that has draw that you're drawing downward is a great aid and a great tool. It makes you smooth, fluid. Uh, it doubles your strength. It, it, there's a lot of wonderful things that it does where people mess up is they allow it to be a crutch. The biggest way that I see it become a crutch is since you have to draw in a lot of rain, people don't let go. So they draw in, they get the horse where they want, and then they hold them there. Well, then the horse gets accustomed to you holding them there. So it's really not a big issue as long as you get what you want, get the softness, get the head position that you want, and then completely drop the reins. Like give them the reins back. And then if you need them again, they're there to grab them and then completely let them go. Um, as far as how long, usually, uh, and I, I don't like to give times, I'm more of a do it so they don't suck at doing it type individual. Uh, for me, it's two, three, four days. It's just enough to show them where I want their head, and then I remove it. And then periodically, you know, once a week, once every couple of weeks, I can pull it back out and use it again. Um, usually, I'm not going to live on it. Usually, yeah, I'm not. Three or four gonna, days is a long time for yeah, you. Usually, I'm not going to live on it. Um, I'm just trying to show them where I want their head. If you feel like you have to live on it, you're not doing a good enough job pressuring them to make them want to put their face there. Or two, more importantly, what most people do is you're not letting go enough so the horse gets accustomed to the crutch and they want to kind of hang on it. If they hang on doubled up strength, they are going to get stiff. I have seen that happen before. 
Miss Brenda from Arizona says she loves the program. I really appreciate that. Let us know if you have any issues. We are here. Still having some issues with tailgating. She does fine with two horses. Add two more and all bets are off. I'm dropping her head and raking her chin. She responds and slows, but within two seconds, she is right back on their tail. What else can I try? There's, a, there's an unwritten code here with our academy students that, hey, if we have issues, like it's fun when we all ride together and we're not really working and we're just hanging out on the trail. But if one of our horses has a meltdown, we try to sort it out. And if it doesn't work, we have a unspoken rule that, hey, you go on this trail, I go on this trail. Granted, I understand a lot of you don't want to ride by yourself. And a lot of you, when you go out with your friends, you don't want to separate. I understand that too. Or you don't see that you don't feel like here's, you see the problem. Here's another thing to think about. If little Johnny does the same thing in the classroom and he gets the same repercussion and he, he goes back and does the same thing, the reper the level of repercussion, a lot of times it's not what you're doing that is wrong. It's the level at which you do it wasn't enough for the horse to say, oh, my goodness, I don't want to do that again. And that's where a lot of us fail is not missing the understanding of how it works the the meat and potatoes of how it works it's that we have a hard time reading our horse and realizing when we need to up that pressure and make that horse think oh oh yes sir yes ma'am i'm sorry i won't do that again uh so just remember anytime you do any and this goes for anything that we do with horses uh or kids or dogs if you say no and then you give a repercussion you know, you're in timeout, you're grounded, I'm taking your Wi-Fi or whatever it is. And they, as soon as they're free, they go right back and make the same mistake again. It is our fault as parents to not have given them a repercussion that they respected enough. And a lot of that is just knowing what really my repercussion for everything is knowing what my horse sucks at. So if I have a horse that's really soft and can kind of like really bury its face and do the thing, that horse, every time that it messes up, I might back it up crooked uh, because it's hard at that. Another horse may really stink at the turnaround, you know, spin. And anytime they mess up, I'll work on the spin, two or three spins, pivot, 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 pivot. And they'll really have to think and focus. Uh, another horse might stink at dropping their head with my spurs, with my, with my heels. And I'll really work on that. Knowing what your horse is not proficient at will gain 100% of your horse's attention. Anything, if you ask me to work a horse, we can still hold this conversation as I'm working the horse. And you can play some music in the background. And I like to listen to podcasts and, and listen to real because I don't have to think about it. Well, the same way I see horse, people that spin horses in a circle every time they act up. Well, the horse gets so proficient at spinning a circle that they can spin and yell for their friends at the same time. That's no longer a good repercussion. We need to do what they suck at and not just busy work, not just get them tired, but something that we want them to be better at. So maybe that horse starts tailgating and you side pass it down the trail for 50 yards. Maybe you back it up for 50 yards. Maybe you back it up crooked. Uh, maybe you work on dropping your head with its spurs until it's like, oh, what are you asking? What are you asking? And it starts dropping its head. All of these things can be really helpful. Remember, a repercussion should always be two things something that we want the horse to get better at and quite frankly the thing that they suck at the thing that they are not proficient at because that's going to draw all their attention go back to me not thinking about horses when i'm riding them if you ask me to do anything with something that has a motor oh my goodness i need all of my attention and yours i need a youtube channel i know nothing about motors and I'm horrible with them so it takes my undivided attention so your horse is the same way Maybe your horse has gotten so soft and easy in the face, that's really not a repercussion. And you need to work on your leg yields, or you need to work on your side pass, or you need to work on your backup. And you start implementing that. Miss Judy says she believes in our program. We really appreciate you, Miss Judy, for trying it. The work only works if you put in the work. Come to a clinic at the Virginia Horse Center in Lexington. A lot of horse owners from the area could benefit from the information you pass on. I would love to come up to, to VA. The last time I was in VA, I was 
partaking in a cult starting competition. Got myself a buckle up that way. I would love to come up there. Guys, I just came back off a tour from these private clinics are the latest thing that we've been doing where we can show up specifically for you and you can split it with yourself or with you and your friends. And I show up in your backyard, in your neck of the woods and work anything and everything that you want to work. And not only that, you guys get to hand select, pick and choose the topics that we discuss. So whether it is liberty or cult starting or problem solving or raining or we're doing Western dressage or we're trying to jump a horse that's refusing or we're, we're running up endurance in the in the mountainside uh, on warm bloods or we're doing natural horsemanship on Mustangs, it there is no limit. It does not matter. So if you guys are, are interested in doing something like that, I am willing, happy and available to come out for you guys. Message us or info at Gascon Horsemanship. Message us or info at what? Gasconhorsemanship.com. Gasconhorsemanship.com. Good. See what we've got here. I always use a voice cue at the end of my whip or finger to ask our blind horse to move over. It seems to work well. Absolutely. Yeah, no, vo vocal cues are going to be great uh, to get the blind horses to move around. Remember, Think about it. You think, oh, my blind horse is so different. Every driving horse out there is blind because they have blinders on, and it's all voice command and showing them by touch exactly where you want them to go. Thank you for giving us so much good and free information. It is so helpful and deeply appreciated. Thank you, Pat. Um, this is my way of giving back. Um, I really had to search far and wide to get all this information and i was lucky enough and blessed enough to have a lot of mentors that were willing to have me in um, but it was i mean i scoured the globe to get this information and i want to put it in one place and make it common core knowledge so that people can be safe because i have seen so much carnage in my life i've seen so many hurt people broken people um Horses that, that got put in horrible places for a mistake that wasn't theirs. So I'm just here trying to, to help people um, be happier with their horses. So it's my way of giving back. Thank you very much. What would you do with a horse who is reactive at one side of the outdoor arena? She'll be great 90% of the time, but then will spook and bolt away, and her owner is getting very tired of it. All right, Miss Miller. If you are having an issue with the horse bolting uh, or spooking uh, or even when we start using the words reactive, I'm not thinking about the react or the spook or the outdoor arena or the bolt. I'm thinking we don't have enough control of that horse's head. I have a horse in right now that is a bolter. I, I know I'm going to fix him. Like without a shadow of that, he's run away with a lot of people. He's hurt a lot of people. He's changed hands a lot. He came here with uh, the person that they got him from. Tell him about the, the market. Like somebody like, so, had bad So, so he he has like uh like the Joker scar. Like why so serious? He has a scar all down his mouth from where somebody I don't know what happened in his past, but he's had a rough life, and he he bolts super hard. There's not a doubt in my mind that he's not going to bolt when he leaves, because. Everybody's missing the, the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is we don't have a steering wheel and we definitely don't have a steering wheel under stimulus. So think about this. Your dog can like to run off every time that it's outside of the house. Well, if you put the collar and the leash on it and it respects the leash and the collar, it cannot run away. It cannot go chase a cat. It cannot go chase a squirrel. But that's a big if. And the dog has to be respectful of that. So for the bolter that I'm working with in training every day now, what I'm doing is making him butter soft, where he cares more about those, those reins and that bridle and that snap or that halter or whatever I put on him. He cares more about that than anything else. That's going to save his life. This far in his life, he's changed hands and changed hands and changed hands because, quite frankly, he's not a safe horse. We are going to get him so soft and easy in the bridle that he's going to be very forgiving and you can do ridiculousness with him. I was dragging tarps off of him. I had a flag above him today um, and just kind of almost at this point of the train, daring him, come on, run off, run off so I can disengage you. So I can take your foot, your face and move your butt. 
I cross your back feet up. So that's what really needs to happen. So if you have a horse that's 90% of the grade and seems unpredictable, it's not that that she's unpredictable. It's that most of the time she wants to do it. And the 10% of the time that she's being unpredictable, she's just showing you that you're not in control, not full control. And really that just comes from controlling the head and controlling the butt. We have to control the face first. And then with that face, we have to show her, if you bolt with me or spook with me, I'm going to take your face and cross up your back feet with it and face the fear. Uh, and when you get to that place where they're more worried about the disengagement than the spook, they will no longer spook with you. Let's see what else we have. I'm not glitching out. This is how Redneck reads. I had a narrator. You didn't need me anymore. Yes, yes. I need you. Where are you at? Okay. Where are you at? <clears throat> the, I don't know what's wrong with the button to allow. So the thing that we use to broadcast all of you guys is not allowing us to add the videos tonight for some reason. Um, I don't know. I've never had this error like this on here. So hopefully it'll be fixed for next week. We'll have a bunch of videos for next week. Um, let's see. Did you just put it on there? Yes. You want me to read it for you? Yes. Sounds like read it. Read it. Judy says, I really need help with Zorro and his new buddy, uh, barn buddy sour issue. It has just cropped up this week. I don't know how to recreate it when I come to you. Gotcha. It's not a buddy sour problem. It's a control the head, control the horse problem. How did you know that? <laughs> If you have Six a years buddy ago. sour, if your horse is study, if your horse is marish, if your horse is barn sour, if your horse is arena sour, none of these are the root of your issue. They're the symptom. And the symptom is the horse is paying attention more to his friends than it's paying attention to you. It's the equivalent. If you're a teenager, you're like, hey, uh, I'm glad you had your little party. It's time to go home. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And they're looking at their phone and not listening. My mother could clear her throat or say all three of my names. And no matter what was happening in the world, my world will stop and I would listen. So it goes right back to the same thing. If he's getting buddy sour, you need to get so much respect that you can go, <clears throat> excuse me. And that horse get quiet immediately out of, uh, I went to a few clinics this, this past weekend. Uh, two thirds of the places that I went have buddy sour issues. The second I would start working with the horse that I was working with, the one in the barn or the one in the paddock would be yelling, but the one that was working with me wasn't yelling because it had its attention completely full. It only had so much attention, and it was right here on me. And they're like, how did you do it? You just demand their respect and their undivided attention. And if you are talking to your horse or if you are talking to your animal and they're looking over here and they're yelling over there, Give them a reason to pay attention to you. Most of the time, it's just backing them up more sternly. It's just making a making uh, abrupt movement where they start, oh, oh, if I look away, you might lose your marbles. I better pay attention to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your videos. I learn every day, and my daughter gives me double takes when I go in the barn with her. I am glad to hear it, buddy. Nothing like some good information. PSD Kennels in the house. Big shout out to those guys. They are getting up their K9 retreat. So if any of you guys have K9s or dogs that you want to have world class uh, training on, my father's been training dogs, military and police dogs and protection dogs for over 40 years. And he program. would happily uh, help you out. Um, the dog kennel is on the other side of the ranch. So the living arrangement is the same thing that we use at our retreats here. And then the kennel is on the far side of the ranch. So you'd be doing the, the work with the, the dogs over there. So we are starting up a K9 section. Uh, check it out right there on um, PSD Kennels. Ooh. You can go to their Facebook page and they have all the information. Mm -hmm. You ready? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, for the tailgating issue, that one? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, stop touching. For the tailgating issue, we have done an exercise where the person in front carries a crop or dressage whip, and as soon as the horse comes up on the butt of the other horse in front, the person waves the whip, so the horse runs into that whip. After a while, the horse stays back. I did this first in the arena and then on our hay field until she stayed back on her own. When we went out on the trail, my mare let this mare pass her and stayed behind. It really worked well. Very nice. Very nice. Guys, that right there is a great example of you don't need a specific exercise. 
all you need is for it to make sense to your horse. There's so many different ways to do it for every exercise that we have, for every grade step, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. We have a dozen different ways to teach kindergarten. We have a dozen different ways to teach first grade, so on and so forth. And the day that I have my, my mainstays, like the things that I do most of the time, but the moment I look at that horse's face and I realize that, hey, nobody, nobody's home, they don't get that, I change what I'm doing. And if that doesn't work, I change what I'm doing. If that doesn't work, I change what I'm doing. Very quickly, I may make four or five adjustments and fix the horse that nobody could fix because people were stuck in doing it a certain way. Guys, when trainers give you exercises, it's not about the exercise. It's about the lesson that the horse is going to learn from that. So if you can think of another way that's going to be clear to the horse, absolutely. So what she's saying about cropping a horse anytime it got close to her horse, the lead horse, it's absolutely the same thing we do when we're ponying. When we pony young colts and problem horses, if they get anywhere close to my knee, they're not allowed past my knee. They're not allowed behind the horse's butt because I don't want them to cross behind me. And they're not allowed in front of the of my knee because I don't want them to shut down the forward on my horse. So very quickly, if they drag behind, my horse drags them. And then if they get, try to jump in front of me, I back them up. Uh, with the halter so they have a, a limited box and it works amazing so if you can do it in that small of a box you can absolutely come up with different ways to keep the horse off of the horse in front of them hey, hey. the private clinic was super helpful and amazing well thank you i thought it was amazing as well it was a good time really appreciate my time up there how many folks would come to a clinic in North Fork River Ranch? I would gladly coordinate it. There we go. Somebody up in Missouri looking to put one on. And that's how these networks work a lot of times is, hey, some friends get together. A lot of times it's people that don't even know each other. They will just kind of network uh, in our community, in our little community that we've kind of put together and find folks with common interests in a common area and boom. And part of the reason that we are really liking this private clinic set up is we've gotten so many of our clients and our followers that have been to clinics, they've been to retreats, they've got to experience all of this, and they're ready to work on the next level. So they want that clinic setting, but they're ready to go further. So having a group of people that already know our method, that have already gone through and kind of worked on some of this stuff, Michael doesn't have to spend as much time catching up everybody to speed on the beginning stages of stuff, like what's in our horse help course. And he can focus on the more advanced things or more advanced problem solving with that group of people that's ready to move on. So that's kind of why this stays in our in our business relationship with everybody. Now we're doing more of the private side of things to really help people get as much as they can, especially if they can't come down. We have people that come down for the retreat three and four times a year. Not everybody can do that. So if we can come to your location and share that knowledge with you and you not have to have all the travel days built in, that's really what this is designed for. Well, and, and one of the things I learned is the amount of help it can get for two or three days of immersion training. I have had life changing, like career changing moments with mentors. Uh, for example, uh, hanging out with Stacy Westfall for two days. I hung out with Stacey Westfall for two days and it put my advanced horsemanship, uh, Western horsemanship uh, up 10 years. Those two days advanced me 10 years in, in my ability to make a bridalist horse, uh, to, to make a, a well-rounded reigning horse. It was really helpful. Uh, Shane Brown, a uh, fraturity reigner, going and hanging out with him for, for three days and riding his fraturity babies. Uh, day in and day out for three days and realizing what you could ask of a horse and how much more there is in most horses gas tanks that was so eye-opening it advanced me years and years in a matter of a couple of days so i want to get to the place where i can offer that these same like life-changing experiences because i've had those and quite frankly it is probably my favorite thing on this earth to do is to have a mentor. Matter of fact, we have a, a mentor coming in tomorrow. We have a Western Pleasure mentor coming in tomorrow for the next two days to work with the Academy students and myself on Western Pleasure because we are teaching over 20 disciplines in our Academy program, and he's one of the mentors I had in. So that's super exciting. Again, two days, it'll be short and sweet, but there will be so much training that goes on in that amount of time. I'm new to your program. Are there videos that I can follow for each grade? I've printed the written parts. Absolutely. 
What's the best way to get to the um, grades? You can go to horsecareer.com forward slash course. I can put the, um, let me hop onto Facebook real quick and I'll put the link in the chat and then we can put it up there. And that, so the difference, you can absolutely, we have so much free content out there that if you guys aren't ready to do even a small investment into our horse health course, you can hop on the YouTube channel. You can follow all of the reels. We have a, pri a, a private community Facebook called Horse Help. You can hop in there and that kind of puts all of our reels together as well. And you can definitely piece together parts and pieces of all the education that we have out there. We have a ton of information. But if you want to be able to put it step by step, be able to download it, be able to have all the workbooks and things that go with that, that's what the course is going to get you. And the way that we've set that up is to try to make it as easily as accessible for anybody to get a hold of. Um, and it's very, very inexpensive. So it's less than the price of two riding lessons normal. Um, so that allows you to have that information, save it forever. It's lifetime access. If we change anything in our program, you get those updates to it. So the cool thing about Michael's system, going through his background, going through all the different things that we do with horses and he's done with training. If you can show him something tomorrow that works better than what we're doing currently, he will immediately go and try that on a hundred horses. And if it works better than what we have, he will drop everything, not hold anything back and switch over to that and add it into our program. Um, so he's not afraid to add something new if you can show him something that works better and works on more breeds and works just like our program does on horses. I'm going to put that link in there right now. And if you have any questions, you can always message the page and email us as well. And yep. I will get that for them. Guys, that's one of the, the reasons that this program is the most uh, evolved in the world is because there's no pride in ownership. Uh, we simply want to be the most evolved, the clearest, the most up-to-date for our horses and allow them to benefit and have the very best future they can have from our teachings or our time with us. So she's absolutely right. I could have been doing something for a decade. If you show me something that's better and you can prove it uh, and I can try it on 20 horses and 20 horses say, hey, yeah, that's better. That's easier. I can pick that up faster. That is now the first thing that we do. Doesn't mean that we forget all the other things that we've learned. It just means it gets pushed back away from the first thing that we do. We're always trying the first thing first. And to be first thing in this program, it has to be the easiest, clearest way for the horse to understand. Mm -hmm. I have a horse that is nervous when tied. I'm not always around, so he's pawing. Will he still learn patience if he, if I leave him tied and he paws? Absolutely. Horses that are tied are like a crock pot. Set it and forget it. Come back in an hour or two. Let him be. That Today he'll paw. Tomorrow he'll paw. The day after that he'll paw less. The day after that he'll paw less. Horses want to exude the least amount of energy. So many times we intervene and hype them back up. Set it and forget it. Uh, as long as they're safe, they're in good footing, they're tied to something that's not going to break with something that's not going to break, good to go. Go ride your horse and come back in uh, and get him later. I missed the first few minutes of this, so maybe already addressed this, but when is the next video review? The next video review is going to be next Wednesday. We have a lot of videos to do, uh, but they are having technical issues with today is the day of the month. You know, whenever we go live for everyone and for whatever reason, with the latest update, we're having an issue with that. So we went straight into our Q and A. What we might do too, since um, usually so once a month we go live for everybody to be able to watch. If you are not on here during the one time of the month that we do that, every week we go live inside of our membership and we get that go through the video reviews. Since we weren't able to get the videos to upload on this one, I will talk to my person who helps me behind the scenes and have her broadcast this again next week for everybody. So you guys can get to see we had 30 minutes worth of videos to review. There's no limit to the amount of videos you can send in when you're a part of the membership club. And that can be a problem you're running into going through one of the grade levels and just have that extra feedback of Michael telling you, stand here, do this, look here, push here, do that. And it's kind of nice to have somebody who can coach you through that. So you go out before the next time that we review those videos the following week, you make those changes and you send in a new video to us. And it really helps expedite that process for you. How is the pretty stallion doing? The one that had a little bark in him in the beginning of episode six, I think. Who was that? Uh, Shrek. Shrek. <laughs> oh, the, the lovely, the lovely. He's for sale, not on sale. No, yeah. he's never for sale. He's not for sale. Personal he's, horse. He's doing awesome. He's doing awesome. He does Liberty, has a lay down. 
Uh, he's walk trot cannon around and he's starting to get on the dummy. So I am very eagerly excited to start making him a rope horse very soon. Why was he the only horse out of the seven horses that we Colt started? I guess total out of the have we Colt started 20 horses so far? We have between the Paso and the quarter horses. Of, out of the whole group that we Colt oh started, he was the only one that bucked. And the reason that he did that is I've had him, I got him baby him. I got him as a stallion, a baby stallion from my friend in March, and I knew we needed him for this challenge, and I needed him to sit until he turned old enough to go through. So I literally had just him. loved him and hugged him and led him from his stall to his turnout. He has had, I didn't want to Thanks. do the respect Small series. Small children, I'll tell you. Like, oh. <laughs> Lots of cuddles and no kindergarten is not great for a stallion. It's fine. Miss Judy says, when I try to control his head, he runs backwards. If he runs backwards and you're in the saddle, Take his face and cross it over his hips until his back feet cross up. Horse can never run backwards with their back feet crossed. If you were on the ground, well, then he starts to run backwards. Don't try to hold him. Instead, lay chase to him and back him past where he wants to, to run into. It says runs backwards, runs me backwards into electric fence and bushes and branches. Yeah, if you, that means you're in the saddle, take his face, cross his back feet up, and it will shut it down. If you have a crop with you, cross his back feet up, get him bent, and then start moving those hips in a circle, and then let forward be the only release. And if he shuts down and go backwards again, take his face over his hips and cross those back feet up, and lay chase with the crop to his inside flank until he wants to go forward and forward becomes his idea. Especially if they're putting you in danger. Yeah, absolutely. If they're running you into electric fences and bushes, yeah, you, you need to take their face and move their butt. Uh, already, Miss Judy, we have somebody that says yes to Missouri. Miss Nicole. It's a great campground, wonderful facilities. Blah, 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 blah. All right, so we have got a discussion going on here. Let's find a question. <laughs> <laughs> they're having fun. Leave them alone. I wish you would sell plans to build your hitching post. That could be done. No problem. Uh, I think we have a video on it. Well, I think Cassidy made I just have to get measured. It's a literal H, uh, a literal H that's chest high. Um, I could definitely get you a, I could get you dimensions on it, uh, but that's all it is. If you get three foot piping, uh, three foot piping, three inch pipe. Um, this is why we need a plan. And, and you put it a couple feet in the ground. I mean, it's a, it's an H. It's uh, 30 inches wide. Uh, but I will be happy to find you the measurements on it. Mm -hmm. I'm still hoping you can come to Horseman's Mission in Millsburg, Ohio, one of these years. Both Jesse and Stacy. Oh, Jesse and Stacy, they're awesome. Uh, present there, as well as Kim and Ab, Guy McClain. I think you all will be a great addition uh, to the presenters there. It's annual event in October. Uh, they also have a neat show like Fantasia uh, at Equine Fair. Millsburg, Ohio. Do you know which one that is? Horseman's Mission? I have not been Millsburg, to Ohio. I haven't heard of it. It's first. Might have to check that out. All right. I think we are at the end of our questions. Guys, this has been a really this has been a really good and productive horse talk live. And I couldn't have done it without you good folks asking the hard questions uh, for me to answer. Things I want you to think about is sometimes things are difficult, but everything with a horse, the answer is simple. Now, granted, I understand. Some things can be simple and not be easy. That's very true. But it is simple. If you are thinking like rocket science, it's very difficult to think in terms of rocket science and turn around and tell your simple four-legged pal simply. So all this information that we're trying to give it to you, we're not only trying to give you this information, but we're trying to use as blatantly casual language as possible. Just small words, simple concepts, Things that you can relate to, to like mothers and children and um, driving and dogs and stuff that you can relate to military uh, because it's simple. Everything with a horse is pressure and release. If you do the wrong thing, you're uncomfortable. If you do the right thing, you are comfortable. And it's really that simple. 
Um, if the horse knows it and they're repeatedly doing the wrong thing, raising that level of mental discomfort until they change their tune. Um, it's just like raising a child. It's just like having a, a good dog around. Um, you're just trying to keep it as simple as possible. This is what I do want. That is what I won't tolerate. And if we can keep it that simple, we can have so many more people safe uh, on their horses. And that is the goal. Safety is our primary concern. Because if you're not safe, it's hard to be confident. If you're not confident, you're not having fun. And if you're not having fun, what are we even doing? Horses are built for fun. So I have a horse that strikes when you try to back him up. He is a sus, so it's kind of normal. For what do I do for that? Do you have any tips or special exercises? Maybe guild him. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before we go to the gelding block, whenever we're asking these horses to back up, first and foremost, when I'm backing strikey horses, I try to stick to code and I try to do it from the front of them. So a couple of things is I'm not going to be underneath them. I'm not going to be in strike distance. And whenever I'm starting these warm blood studs or thoroughbred studs, real tall, lanky horses that can strike you from a distance, I'm doing it pretty close to the end of the lead rope. I'm asking in the back, and I can be 10, 12 feet away from you and still shake that rope and make you uncomfortable. And you don't beat a horse with power. You beat them with persistence. And I will persistently keep that halter so busy that they rear and they strike and they throw a bite in the air. And then the moment their feet touch the ground, they take a step or a lean back. I get quiet momentarily. And then I do it again. Another pro tip is you may double up that rope. So you, let's say you're 10 feet away from them and you double up that lead rope in your hand and they're coming at you, striking and biting, and you're just going to be swinging it back and forth. Woof, woof, woof. So that if they get past a certain space in your bubble, they get knocked in the, in the muzzle with that lead rope going back and forth. I don't like to use the popper. I like to double it up. It's going to make it heavier and easier to swing. But more importantly, uh, you're not going to have the tassel around their face. It'll just be a U uh, of lead rope that's going back and forth. Very few horses can deal with that. Very few, even strikers and biters uh, can deal with, with that. But it's really all about space. Um, it's like boxing. You always want to be out of their range, but in your range is where you're trying to be. If for whatever reason, they're still so nasty, that doesn't work. Um, by all means, grab you a set of long lines and put long lines on the halters. There's a slot special built in uh, in the side of your halter for long lines. You'll see a double strand here. The long lines, they go through that strand and then get behind the horse, 15 feet behind the horse and ask the horse to back there and get them sent. Like that's your chance and your opportunity. They can strike and bite and try to murder you and squeal at you. Usually I'll be at a clinic with some blue eyed chestnut mare that's trying to murder the world with me in it. I'll just get 10 feet behind them and back them from there. And then once I back them 50, 80, 100 feet and, then, and now I'm just touching their face and they're backing up because there was no release unless they backed up. Then I can get back in front of them and they're backing up so much easier that I can incorporate that to being in front of them and asking them to back. So I would try those things uh, before I gelt him for life. In unless you're already thinking of gelting him, then well, then go ahead. Very good question. All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And I will see you next week on Horse Talk Live. Appreciate Bye. you.